The Australian Psychedelic Society presents the fourth seminar in the Perth Altered States series. Please join us as academics Dr. Chris Letherby and Tobias Pano present and explore philosophical, scientific and clinical perspectives on the relationships between psychedelics and meditation. Hello, good morning everyone. Welcome to our seminar four. I'm Tobias. I'm a researcher and practitioner in the psychedelic space. I offer psychedelic integration um, in a private practice and I'm also in, uh, doing my PhD investigating the role of the therapist in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Um, I'm going to present to you a little bit about my research now and so just to clarify, it may not be immediately clear how my research is related to mindfulness. My research is about how the therapist or a sitter might uh, be with their client and my research is revealing the need for a kind of interpersonal mindfulness or interpersonal meditation which supports the person to contain, process and deepen their experiences with psychedelics. When I finish up we'll have a short five minute break where you guys can just take a breather in your seats, have a chat amongst yourselves and after that I'll introduce Chris Lethby who will take you on a more nuanced journey of the neurobiological correlates of mindfulness and psychedelics. I'd like to start with a little video, if it works. The use of uh, things that would lift us out of the egocentric situation could therefore be med considered medical as healing for a social disorder. But again, I would say that they used in that way should be used as medicine in the sense that they don't become diet. Because in my experience, and of course in this matter, everybody speaks for themselves, but say I consider just myself alone, uh, I wouldn't feel very uh, put out if, say, LSD were to vanish from the earth tomorrow. Because I have discovered that this is not the sort of thing you sort of take every so often, like you go to church, or if you do, uh, but it's something that you can take uh, several times in a gradually diminishing quantity, and then you've had it. Beyond that, it's up to you to integrate your vision with uh, everyday life, and with all the various kinds of knowledge. Uh, that's uh, en enough is enough. But there are other people who seem to think that uh, the, the great thing to do is to start out with a little and then keep on going, making it bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, as if they were looking for something uh, that should lie at the end of the diet. And then it becomes a diet. So also, when it comes to the use of any technique whatsoever, whether it's yoga or LSD or what have you, for the spiritual awakening, there applies to it the Buddha's symbol of the raft. The Buddha likened his method, his dharma, or doctrine or method, to a raft. It's also called a yana, or vehicle, hence the mahayana, the big vehicle, the hinayana, the little vehicle. And it takes you across the river of which this shore is birth and death and the other shore liberation, nirvana. Now you get on that raft and you go over and when you get to the other shore, you leave the raft behind. Same way they say in Zen Buddhism, uh, their technique, the use of the koan or meditation problem is like knocking at a door with a brick. When the door is opened, you don't carry the brick inside leave the brick behind. So with all these things, they are means, upaya, and they have as their objective deliverance from means. And uh, I would extend the, the sense of the word means even to ecstasy. In other words, ecstasy is invariably in the great religious traditions not a final state. Ecstasy is an intermediate state. Uh, so, for example, in, in Zen, 
when the experience of satori or awakening comes about there is an ecstasy you feel marvelous you feel as if you were walking on air you feel absolutely unobstructed you feel as happy as a lark you feel you know this fantastic bang it's marvelous but that in itself is only incidental a Zen saying says that monk who has a satori goes to hell as straight as an arrow in other words to have it is to cling to it and if you think that the ecstasy is the important thing it isn't the the ecstasy is an intermediate stage to bring you back to the point where you can see that everyday life that your ordinary mind as they say in Zen is the Buddha mind that everyday life as it is is the great thing and there is no difference between that and the divine life <sighs> I'm not going to comment uh, on that video, I'm just going to let that sit with you and percolate in the background of, of our presentations today. So, what is an altered state anyway? Um, so, uh, altered state is typically shorthand for an altered state of consciousness. And one definition that I found that was particularly useful was altered states of consciousness are alternative patterns or configurations of experience which differ qualitatively from a baseline state. In other words, any experience which is different in a significant way to normal waking consciousness. Some researchers uh, came up with a, a way of classifying the uh, altered states that we might enter into by how they are induced. So, for example, we have the spontaneous types of alternate states. So, your, your daydreaming and your near-death experiences. We have your physical and physiological ones, like through fasting and sexual practices. We have psychological means of getting to an altered state through music or meditation, hypnosis or breath work. And there are the more pathological types due to perhaps brain damage or certain mental conditions. And finally, we have the pharmacological types of entering an altered state, such as those that we might experience through psychedelics. So today we'll be focusing on the psychological, meditative, and the pharmacological ones. So I wanted to comment just briefly about the spiritual path, and I wanted to ask the audience, um, if you're comfortable to answer, who here would consider themselves spiritual and, or on some kind of spiritual path? Can I get a raise of hands? Okay, most of you. Cool. <laughs> I was going to say, for those of you who are not spiritual, perhaps you could replace this word that I have here with um, being a happy person. <laughs> so on this sort of so-called spiritual path, it seems to me that there are sort of three key components to spirituality. One is deconditioning. Two is cultivating. And three is awakening. What do I mean by each of these? Well, in the first one, nobody gets through life unscathed. We all develop responses, conditioning to life events earlier on, a way of adapting to help us survive and manage life situation that perhaps later on is no longer serving us or useful. So we might do some deconditioning work. We might do some therapy or some healing um, to process that. Cultivating, this one is about the cultivation of positive qualities such as love, uh, empathy, compassion. And finally, the third one, this one is, a, is, a, is about um, a process that can sometimes radically shift our way of perceiving and experiencing the world. Things like enlightenment or bliss states or abiding love, equanimity. Um, there's a Buddhist concept called shunyata where you experience that, that, uh, the formless nature of, of everything. So I present this today to help frame what we are talking about. And I find it interesting to think about the sort of mental health industry, for example, where it is more or less pretty singularly focused on, one, deconditioning. 
That's its role. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. But when we think about mindfulness meditation and when we think about psychedelics, where do they seem to operate on these three different components? I dare say that with both of them, they work on all three. But it seems that mindfulness and, or meditation and psychedelics work on these three in really different ways. How so? I'm going to leave you that, with that question unanswered, and I'm very excited to hear what Chris will be sharing about the different ways that mindfulness and psychedelics seem to work a little bit later. What I will say is that many chase the awakening component to the almost complete neglect of uh, deconditioning and cultivating, um, as is the sort of, there is a criticism of many of the gurus of the East who are sort of completely dedicated to the process of deep self-inquiry. Um, and people with trauma might be approaching them, but not being directed to, to do some of the, the base work before they go to these deeper places. So essentially what I'm saying is that, that, that sometimes if you're focusing entirely on the awakening, that could be imbalanced. And perhaps there's a lesson here for psychedelic users as well. My suggestion is that, yes, you might be able to use psychedelics to bypass step one and achieve deep states of awakening. However, without also developing a stable platform through the maturity of deconditioning and healing work, this may be destabilizing or confusing. So that brings me to my focus um, for today's talk, which is on the deconditioning work that can be done with psychedelics. So we've kind of focused on the, uh, on the intrapersonal elements of altered states. You know, how can I change my state of mind? How can I change my state of mind? So now I'd like to shift over to the interpersonal elements. What about when you are in the room with a sitter or a trained psychotherapist? What is happening then? So imagine yourself in a therapy room. Imagine just like this. You're sitting in one of those chairs and across from you is a trained psychotherapist, right? In one of those mugs in the middle there is a powerful dose of magic mushrooms that you're about to drink. What do you want from your therapist, right? Do you even want to be in this, this kind of room right now? I'd like to invite you to just take two minutes to have a chat to one of your neighbors or silently reflect, reflect by yourself what, what you would want from a therapist. Hey guys, just winding up your chats. Does anyone have... Um, an answer or two that they, they have shared that they'd be happy to share in front of the group. Yep. I, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, I was drinking. I thought you were well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, 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 Good. Um, I, w <laughs> I would want to feel like, I would want the therapist to know why I'm there. One thing, so that maybe the things that, like you said, it, with regards to the deconditioning or conditioning, I would want them to know about the patterns that I've conditioned myself into using to get through a day-to-day -day basis so that in a state where I feel accepted and uh, safe with them, they could encourage me to possibly, like, what would it look like if you expressed this part of yourself that you never allowed yourself to? So, like, someone who's very accepting, understands me, um, and is willing to see every part that could possibly come up and encourage me that I'm capable to get through it as well. Okay, cool. Someone that believes in you, someone that accepts you completely and is willing to see all parts of you, and someone who knows enough about your history to kind of maybe help you to tease apart some of that. All right, so what does the literature say? What's, what's being talked about in the psychedelic literature? So um, in 2017, Janice Felt Phelps published a paper where she suggested six core competencies for a psychedelic therapist. The first one was empathic abiding presence. And I want to say here, just a little like side note f for me, that um, it, it seems to be more and more accepted in the literature that empathy, um, there are two components to empathy. There's like a cognitive empathy and there's like an affective empathy. Cognitive is your mind appraising that yes, this person is in a difficult situation or that this is how they're feeling. Affective empathy is you feeling what they're feeling, you feeling with them. And um, there, was a, there was a recent edition in the uh, Australian Association of Social Workers, uh, a special edition on embodiment practices, where they speak about um, empathy, uh, they speak about the body being an instrument for empathy. 
And that's, that's how I'd like to consider embodiment in this talk, because being embodied is one thing, to be in your body, to be with yourself in that way. But using your body and embodiment as an instrument for relating deeper with another person is, is another step. It's a layer deeper. So that's a side note. Um, number two, trust enhancement. So the researchers said that it was really important that the therapist could build trust, of course, in themselves, but also that they um, could build trust in the person to, um, to trust in their own inner healer so that they believed in themselves to go through the process. And finally, so to build trust in the process itself because the psychedelic experience can be quite overwhelming and surprising sometimes, and it's important for them to be able to... to uh, it meets those challenging moments, trusting that this too will pass, that this is all part of the process. Number three, spiritual intelligence. So I guess this one is, is about the therapist having a kind of familiarity with transcendental states, mystical states, and drawing meaning out of those states. Um, and I really love what Rachel Harris, uh, an author who wrote a book called Listening Ayahuasca, to Ayahuasca, says about this. And she actually cautions a lot of therapists not to get too excited when they hear deep, mystical, visionary stories from their clients. Not to, to take that down and rationalize it too quickly, unless it has a very specific therapeutic purpose. And so she, she like want, encourages people to protect those mystical states. And so I think this, this competency is about having a familiarity with that, that process of, of mysticism that you can guide somebody through it. Number four, this one's pretty self-explanatory, knowledge of the physical and psychological effects of psychedelics. Number six, again, pretty self-explanatory, therapist self-awareness and ethical integrity. Um, and number six is a, a proficiency in complementary techniques. So interestingly, in this competency, Janice alludes to many different body-centered body -centered practices, such as holotropic breath work, um, therapeutic bodywork, touch, um, felt sensing and focusing, somatic experiencing. Uh, it's very alluded. Uh, it, she alludes very heavily to body-centered practices. My suggestion is that this competency six could be clarified or replaced in a way that we end up with a foundational um, skill set, which I would call a somatic relational skill set, or in other words, proficiency with embodiment. So the, the research project that I'm working on is looking specifically at how the therapist holds themselves in the psychedelic session. And what appears to be the case is that the more cognitive top-down approaches, trying to have a conversation with someone while they're in a psychedelic state, just doesn't work, does not land so well. If you are intending to go to deep places of healing with psychedelics, you really need to create a container of safety. And yes, some of that safety comes from structure and knowledge. But especially if the healing is coming from those really early on places in life, in your development, then that safety has to be created through relationship instead. And that is where a somatic relational skill set um, becomes so important. Embodiment or somatic relational um, practices r reveal themselves in the psychedelic literature already, uh, often in an implicit way, as with um, Phelps's first competency, empathic abiding presence. If you read into that, you can see that she really is talking about an embodied empathy. Um, but in increasingly, embodiment is being talked about in quite explicitly in the literature. So, um, for example, the uh, MAPS manual for MDMA-assisted psycho psychotherapy, they say that it is required that at least one therapist on the team be well-versed in a method of addressing somatic manifestations. Therapists may benefit from training in techniques, recognizing sensory motor level psychological influence, and strictly behavior or cognitive behavioral approaches are likely to be limiting. Recently, there was a publication where um, some, some authors actually developed a fully-fledged whole clinical model for how to work in clinical practice with integration in psychedelics. And in it, they also talk about the body and its role in integration. They say that it is helpful to recognize the experience of psychological difficulties in terms of stress felt in the body. And as such, the embodiment and integration of a psychedelic experience involves the incorporation of somatic work. Uh, some other researchers are talking about it in a slightly different way with respect to ayahuasca. Fotiu and Giran talk about the way that ayahuasca helps to make spiritual and psychological maladies tangible, visible, and even visceral. 
and the act of expelling such maladies through purging has been ad adopted across many cultures of, of ayahuasca use. Purging is considered a means of purifying and healing a polluted mind and body of afflictive psychic energies, um, substances, past experiences. And more than just a purge through vomiting, people also purge through yawning, crying, sweating, fever, burping, moaning, defecating, and, and physical contortion. A common theme of descriptions of ayahuasca purging was the expulsion of past traumatic experiences. Drinkers describe letting go, releasing, and unblocking past traumas, uh, um, and pa releasing past experiences and healing trauma through the, the act of purging. One author even uh, wrote an entire paper um, on how one could combine a type of therapy called authentic movement therapy, which is a form of dance therapy, how that could be combined with the protocol that they've developed for the MAPS uh, MDMA for PTSD, um, which I thought, which is a, just a really fascinating read. But, so that's one of the ways that it's showing up in the literature. So I've talked a bit about embodiment. What is it? What is embodiment? We experience our worlds in the present moment through our bodies through proprioceptive, kinesthetic, and vestibular awareness, through interoception, our ability to sense and feel internal states in our body, and through neuroception. You might not be as familiar with this concept, neuroception, but um, essentially the idea is that we are constantly, just beneath our conscious awareness, our brain and body is looking around and examining our environment and the people in it and basically looking for uh, danger or safety and, and no. And if it does detect danger, then it's gonna ping that alert to your amygdala and your body's gonna start to move into a stress response beneath your conscious awareness. Um, embodiment is not a conceptual awareness that we have a body, but an experiential awareness of being a body. And finally, embodiment is a portal to our past. As we seek deeper, deeper into our felt, felt sense of now through the body, we begin to also contact the past and how it is throw, showing up in the present through our bodies. This can be through gestures, through stress responses, muscular tension, and through all of the non-verbal, visual, facial, tactile, gestural, auditory, prosodic kind of interactions. These are all happening just beneath conscious awareness and draw upon a reservoir of implicit memories which appear to reside predominantly in our right brain. So I want to introduce you to an author, Dr. Alan Shaw, who is an absolute giant of the emerging field of interpersonal neurobiology, who developed a theory called regulation theory. And this brings us to attachment and, and the development of a child in their early phases. Right, this theory, this regulation theory, uh, represents a way of understanding attachment as not merely a survival mechanism that supports infant proximity to a primary caregiver. It is an affective regulatory mechanism from the infant's right brain to the parent's right brain of implicit relational synchrony. The child develops an implicit unconscious self exactly through the relationship with their primary caregiver. They're getting their needs met through nonverbal communication. And these early attachment dynamics are understood to be foundational experiences, which are not just experiences, but actually embedded into the architecture of the developing brain, and in particular of the right developing brain. These experiences biologically set in motion the child's future capacity for co-regulation, regulating their emotions with another person, self-regulation, regulating their emotions for themselves, and for all future relationships with other humans. So that brings me to attachment trauma. So what is attachment trauma? Basically, it's a disruption in this very important process of bonding with a primary caregiver. Um, this trauma can be uh, overt abuse or neglect, or it can be simply a lack of affection or response from a caregiver. The effects of attachment trauma are far-reaching and have been correlated with many psychopathologies that develop later in life, such as personality disorders, dissociative disorders, mood disorders, and vulnerability to post-traumatic stress disorder. 
The available literature suggests that a safe and secure early childhood relationship um, are foundational, fundamental to the biological, psychological and social development of a child and for the, the functional maturation of their nervous system. And finally, importantly, this disruption happens in quite large numbers, with a study showing that at least two in five people have a measurable degree of attachment disruption, although many authors suggest that this number is much higher um, and that this is only measuring people who are now suffering from mental distress because of those attachment disruptions. But many of us have these attachment disruptions but are still managing to be quite functional. Okay, so that leads us to a whole mode of therapy, right? It's called right brain psychotherapy, where the interaction with the psychotherapist is intended to go beneath the conscious awareness, the, the dialogue of the mind through verbal language. Um, and, the, and authors who, who are speaking about this model of therapy are sort of saying that it is, it is a core skill. It's not a new model or a new intervention. It's actually a core skill which underlies all forms of psychotherapy. Um, because, and, and it's these right brain processes of, of empathy and the regulation of your effect and the ability for the therapist to receive and express nonverbal communication and the sensitivity to register really slight changes in the, uh, the other person's expression and emotion um, and an immediate awareness of how that affects them um, and to be able to sort of support a kind of dynamic co-regulation with their client that might provide, say, a um, corrective experience if that person did not get certain needs met when they were developing as a child. Um, then the therapeutic encounter becomes an opportunity for a corrective experience with a safe adult that can help them to regulate, to firstly co-regulate their emotions, which then enables them the capacity to self-regulate their emotions. Okay, visions of the right brain. So something interesting that is emerging from the literature is that psychedelics seem to amplify features characteristic of right brain processing. Um, Kaha Harris and his team at Imperial College London have shown that a change in interhemispheric communication may be an important factor in psychedelic healing processes. Alan Shaw, uh, in his recent publication, The Development of the Unconscious Mind, points out that Freud was onto something when he described the unconscious and wrote of it as a special realm with its own desires and modes of expression and peculiar mental mechanisms not elsewhere operative. Shaw points out that this speculation is now confirmed by a body of data, suggesting that the right hemisphere is the biological substrate of the unconscious, and that it matures before the left, and that the right brain is dominant in human infancy. And interestingly, the rhetoric in psychedelics is that what they do is they make the unconscious conscious. And so there is a sort of speculative possibility that, hey, what psychedelics are doing is they are bringing the, uh, the right brain to the fore, to the front. We are kind of entering a childlike state when we are under a psychedelic. Um, and if that's the case, then working in a way according to this sort of right brain psychotherapy process is no longer just a useful option for working with psychedelics, but an essential core skill set for a therapist. The client is thrown into this right brain vulnerable state like a child and the importance of the therapist to be with them, for them to feel felt and to be safe in an embodied way is paramount. So my suggestion is, as I said before, that a somatic relational skill set should be a, a core skill set underlying all of the other important core skill sets. So what is a somatic relational skill set? Um, I hope that I've inspired curiosity into the realm of somatics and relational processing. The interpersonal domain, which in a lot of ways is like a right brain to right brain interpersonal mindfulness meditation of co-regulatory support. Hopefully that could eventually instill in a person uh, the neurobiology of that person, the capacity for intrapersonal regulation and a secure relationship with their own inner healer. And so it is from here that my research actually starts. Yes, it is clear that a somatic relational skill set is useful, but a somatic relational skill set is 
a huge area. There are so many different modalities, so many different theories, so many different ways of working that, that's out there in the literature. So what of that vast body of data and practices, what of that is useful for the psychedelic experience? And that's, that's the question that drives the research that I'm doing at the moment. And I'm just going to give you just like a little touch of some of the stuff that, that I've found so far before I finish up. First of all, trauma-informed, right? The therapist needs to be aware of different stress responses, fight, flight, freeze, friend, and what they look like, how to recognize them, and how to, if somebody's hyper-aroused, bring them down. If they're hypo-aroused, bring them up and keep them in the window of tolerance for therapy. Uh, they need to be skilled at resourcing, right? Giving the client um, the capacity to go to places of safety for themselves. Embodied practice. It seems over and over again important that all of the therapists that I'm speaking to, all of the people I'm talking to about this skill set, is that in order to be able to do that for a client, they absolutely have to do it for themselves. They need to have their own practice of somatic meditation, attunement, embodied empathy, if they're going to be able to deliver that in a psychedelic session. Touch is one that has come up time and time again. Clients are enter this vulnerable state, and so often they are yearning for that unmet need that they, that they had as a child, and asking for a hug, asking for somebody to hold their hand. Um, and so it's really important that a therapist is trained in how to use touch in a skillful way that isn't dangerous and doesn't cross boundaries. Process oriented. So a bit different to a lot of mainstream therapy, which can be quite outcome focused, it's really important that therapists are able to trust the inner healer of the other person and trust the emergent properties of the process. Somatic transference, this is a really important one. So again, if a person is being taken to that right brain, if they're taken to that childlike state, then it can be very easy for them to project onto the therapist, say, another relationship that's important in their life. A parent, for example, they might, if, you, if I'm a male therapist working with somebody, they might project their father onto me and start to experience the interaction with me as if I was their father and start to respond in a way that was according to that. Um, and one of the things that's really important is for the therapist not to reject that transference. It can be very tempting to push it away and say, no, that's not me, I'm not that. But if you have the skill to know, to allow it and not respond to it in a pushing way and actually then you give the client an opportunity to work through the issues that they had with that person, through you as a therapist. Uh, clinical intuition is, is another one. Um, this one's really fun. Uh, some of the things that I'm finding out is, is that therapists have found that they have an ability to sense when, say, for example, a transference is happening because they, are, they get cues from their own body letting them know that something is going on here. And so there's this sort of capacity that can be developed for, uh, for intuition through the aperture of the body. Um, implicit relational processing and trauma processing skills. So the ability to, um, to safely help somebody to process a trauma from their past is so important. Uh, and right brain psychotherapy, what I've already explained to you. That whole field seems to be um, very important for this work. So, I'd like to finish with a little quote and to let you know that this isn't new stuff. It may seem contemporary, modern, neurobiological, um, but a lot of this work, a lot of the psychedelic work, a lot of the embodiment work is really an old system that we are remembering, rediscovering. The dance of the medicine man, priest or shaman belongs to the oldest form of medicine and psychotherapy in which the common exaltation and release of tensions was able to change man or woman's physical and mental suffering into a new option on health. We may say at the, that at the dawn of civilization, dancing, religion, music and medicine were inseparable. Thank you. <laughs>